Hello everybody! Thanks again for visiting my YouTube channel. This is the place where we discuss the Lord's Recovery Movement of Witness Lee, also known as the Local Church Movement. Well, I guess it's time to rev it up again. I'm going to go to the second new article in fall of 2023 on shepherdingwords.com. This one is entitled, When Problems Arise in the Local Churches, Avoiding Two Errors. And so they go on to talk about the two errors. In doing so, they make many more than two errors, which I think is kind of funny. Basically, what they're talking about in this article is, if there are problems in the churches, how to handle it, what to do, and what to avoid. So they start out the article with this paragraph. When problems arise in the local churches, there is a tendency among some to ask, if this ministry in the local churches are really a recovery of the Lord, how could such things happen? To answer this question, we need to consider the record of the New Testament concerning the nature and function of the ministry and concerning the standing versus the condition of the church. Well, let me just say this about this first paragraph. As soon as you start calling yourself the recovery, then you've set a higher standard for yourself in some kind of way. You just call yourself the church. We're the body of Christ. We're a local church. That's all fine. Nothing wrong with that. But when you start claiming to be the recovery and the Lord's move and every other place on earth is fallen religion and the present evil age, then, well, yes, you have set a higher standard for yourself. You're not allowed to have the same kind of problems other people have because you're so much better than everybody else. And isn't that what you're saying? You're the recovery, so you're better. As far as I can tell, being the recovery is just some kind of privilege they've given themselves, which allows them to do things that other people wouldn't do, like sue other Christians and call the rest of the body of Christ the present evil age. And I don't see it that they set themselves to a higher standard overall. Yeah, they get to have their cake and eat it too. They get to be the best thing going. And yet they get to say, well, we're just like everybody else. We have problems. Churches in the first century had problems and they were the Lord's move. So we can have problems too. And it doesn't say we're not the Lord's move. Well, let me just say it again. Everybody's the Lord's move. Every Christian is part of the Lord's move. And every Christian who is reasonably faithful is operating God's move because God's move is much bigger and much wider and much more all-encompassing than anything that can be contained in one movement, especially a movement run by these guys because they haven't got a clue. This article is once again them trying to maintain control of their movement, but they do it in a slightly different way here. They don't push their authority so much. They just basically say, we're it and you can't go anywhere else. We've got the best ministers, so therefore we must be it. We got this good thing and we got this good thing. We got this good thing. Isn't this evidence we're it? On and on and on and on and on ad nauseum. This is their attitude. Well, in the first place, where does it in the Bible, does it say there's an it and there's a not it in the body of Christ? Where does it say that? I don't see that. I don't see any kind of word in the Bible that says that one group of Christians get to say their thing is better and declare it as if it's a truth of God and then make their standing on that. Basically, they got two things. They got this ministry, which they think is really great, which impresses a lot of people. And granted, it does have some good things in it. Their other thing is more down to earth and much more stark. And that is this matter of the local ground, which they bring up at the end of this article. That's the thing they really use as the final linchpin to try to hold people there is this thing about we got the local churches. We are the local churches. If you're not in the local church, you're not in the true church the way God wanted it to be. So therefore, you're probably not even in a church. Actually, you're not in a church because they've said many, many, many times, if you're not a local church, you're not really a church. So that's the one they pull, and that's why they're so keen on keeping it, because it's what holds people there. That's what the local ground teaching does. It holds people there. Well, the local ground teaching is not a biblical teaching. I said they made several errors in this message. I'll just go to this one where they says at the end, talking about our responsibility to the Lord, and they make some general valid points, which anybody can apply anywhere. 
they say, what then should we do when faced with problems or turmoil in the church? Boy, those turmoils, you guys sure have a lot of them. Above all, we must seek to overcome by living and magnifying Christ. Okay, follow closely the apostles' teaching brought to us by the ministers of the New Testament. Yes, those were the apostles in the first century. It's not Witness Lee or Watchman D. It's not Ron Kangas. It's not those functioning as apostles in the Lord's recovery. Those aren't the ministers who brought you the New Testament. And the New Testament is open to interpretation. And your interpretation is not necessarily the valid one. And you have to know that. And you have to believe that. And if you're so certain it is that you go to the extremes you guys go, I'm certain you're wrong. Because if you were living and magnifying Christ, you wouldn't be going around swinging your weight around. And you wouldn't be calling the rest of the body of Christ the present evil age. All this stuff is designed to distance themselves from everybody else, make themselves special, try to convince people that this is the only place they can be. You know, all those things that aberrant and cult-like groups do. That's what they're doing. But they go on to talk about living in the way of life and not fomenting contentions. Well, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that Christians don't go around being contentious, but I don't feel like I'm being contentious. To me, being contentious is bickering with somebody. It's just, you said this. That's being contentious. Being contentious is not calling this group on errors they've made like I've done. I mean, I've had fun and I've used humor and I've used sarcasm, but I challenge anybody to tell me where I've been mean and contentious. I'm not being contentious. I just, when I ask a question, I expect a decent answer. And if I don't get one, that's a strike against you. Not answering is a strike against you. Pretending that I asked something that I didn't ask, like this brother who sounded off a few messages ago, pretending I said something I didn't say. That just, to me, just the light bulb goes on. He's desperate. He's losing the argument. Why would he be doing this if he was so sure of himself? And the thing I've said about these co-workers in the Lord's Recovery in North America is that they don't really seem to be that confident. They keep repeating over and over and over again what they say. But if they really had confidence in their message, they wouldn't need to push anybody around because they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord was completely on their side and that he was going to prevail in their movement one way or another. And why would they need to continually be pushing people around and trying to control people if they were really confident in the Lord? I mean, that's what humble and faithful ministers do. Even Watchman Nee talked about, don't vindicate. Don't push your opinion. Don't try to manipulate people. That's humility. Well, they don't practice that. They pretend they're not vindicating. But really, the reason they don't answer the question is because they don't have an answer. At least one that will stand up anywhere other than a room full of people that dare not disagree in the first place. They continue on with this last paragraph in this article. They say, furthermore, the Lord never tells us to abandon the genuine ground of the church. Okay, he never tells us to embrace it either. He never tells us to embrace their vision of the ground of the church. It's not in the Bible. Where does the Lord tell us to never abandon the genuine ground of the church? And I'm confused sometimes what they're talking about when they're talking about the ground of the church because the ground of the church is oneness in Christ. Okay, that's the real ground of the church. But they act like it's the local ground, the city. You've got to be in the church in the city. And they switch back and forth. It's called equivocation. And every person that's trying to deceive and manipulate does this. They change the meaning of their terms to suit the situation. And they use a phrase meaning one thing For example, the ground of the church is the oneness of Christ. Absolutely, we should never abandon the oneness that's in Christ. Okay, but what does that mean? Never abandon the oneness in Christ. When we're asked to remove an exceedingly contentious member in a church and distance from him or her, is that abandoning the oneness? What does it really mean in practice? So there are times when we do part ways with people. And there have been many times when the leaders of the Lord's recovery have parted ways with people. But somehow it's okay when they do it, but wrong when anybody else does it. This shows they believe they have a special status and a special set of rules that apply to them because of what they believe they are. Well, that's a wide open vista there. 
that anybody can use. Just believe you're something special and then expect everybody to treat you as if you are. Why not just go back to the essentials of the New Testament and apply them to everybody, which is love your brothers and sisters, observe the oneness with people, don't be contentious with people, don't be mean to people, don't call people rebels just because they oppose the leadership in your little movement. The Lord's Recovery couldn't stand prosperity. They had some good things early on. We can admit it, there were some very good things there. Really didn't find elsewhere as much. The love between brothers and sisters and hospitality and caring for one another is everywhere. Maybe not in the 1960s as much as it is now, but now it's everywhere. Churches know to do this. But we did have that. It was kind of a thing where we got into some stuff that was probably on a little bit deeper level than maybe with other people. The problem is we assume from that that we were special and the movement was special. That's a big mistake. That's like a minister having revelation and assuming he's special or she's special, which is what Paul didn't do. He actually went the other way and was self-deprecating because he didn't want to think that way about himself. He wouldn't even say he was the guy that got the revelation. He said he knew a man that got this revelation. Okay, he wouldn't even say it was him because he knew that stuff can go to your head. Well, it going to their head and to Witness Lee's head is the calling card of these guys. They got some things. Watchman D did one thing that was pretty exhaustive, and that was he scoured church teachings and assimilated what he thought was the best stuff. And then he reproduced it in his own words, and there was a lot of good stuff in there. But there was a lot of bad stuff, too, particularly his view on authority, authority and submission, and the whole idea where he starts out, the authority is the most important thing in the universe. You say stuff like that, but it's what you're implying that gets you in trouble. Yes, God's authority is very, very important. We are supposed to obey God. We are supposed to honor God and not oppose him. But that doesn't translate to people or even God's servants. We don't treat God's servants like they're God. We don't treat them like we have to obey them and submit to them all the time. That's not true. Actually, when the Bible talks about submission, it says submit one to another. And that's talking about humility. That's talking about having an attitude where God can speak through anybody. So I better listen. But that doesn't mean you agree just because this person has some credentials and just because they make the claim, well, I knew Witness Lee and he knew Watchman Nee. So we're special. You know, this line of succession thing, that's Catholicism. The Catholic Church is the same way. Being in the Lord's recovery is the same thing as being in the Catholic Church. Catholics would be fine with you if you just say you're a Catholic. Most of them aren't really that way now, but they were. And the whole thing is, we are the Catholic Church. We are the universal church. We are the church that Peter started. Well, Lord Recovery is doing the same thing. They're God's move. They're the God's move that Watchman Nee and Witness Lee recovered. And we got back into what we were supposed to be doing. So what? That doesn't mean everybody else is meaningless. It means you had something. You know, you got the ball handed to you, and what did you do with it? Did you really expand the Lord's body or did you expand a movement? Are you really defending the Lord's body or are you defending a movement? Are you defending an organization? I say they're defending a movement in an organization. They just get mixed up on which is which. They don't seem to know the difference. The whole thing stems from this attitude of they really aren't looking at the body of Christ as a whole. They're not looking at the body of Christ for what it is. It's all the Christians. They're looking at it as if it's the people in their movement, and that's a big mistake. To go back to this article, they talk about the ministry, and once again, they're talking about it's the ministry from the apostles. It's the one ministry. It's the one that builds up the body of Christ, and it's this and that. Listen, guys, there are a lot of ministries that are building up the body of Christ. If you consider building up the body of Christ as the growth of the members of the body of Christ, not the growth of a movement or an organization, not the growth of a church in the sense of the church is getting more people in it. That's not what growth is. Growth is people becoming more like Christ. Growth is people going deeper in their relationship with Christ. That's growth. And if I've been in a neighborhood and everybody who lives in all these houses here in this neighborhood are all growing in Christ in their own way, the body of Christ is being built up. We need each other. 
Yes, the gifts are to build up the body of Christ. We need each other and we need our gifts and we need to get together and not be lone rangers. But that doesn't mean we all have to be in the same organization in the city. In one sense, it's true. There is one church in the city you're in. That's true. And there's also one church in the county you're in. And there's also one church in the state you're in. And there's also one church in the country. And there's also one church in the world. These are all the same church. A church is simply a part of that body which people meet in. Because church simply means gathering of called out ones. It's a community. It's people in relationship. It's people meeting together. It's people talking. It's people building each other up. It's people trying to be faithful to the Lord in some cooperation with each other. But the idea that, oh, for the body of Christ to be built up, we all have to be in this same organization, which is led by, lo and behold, people that are faithful to that movement. Those are the only churches they recognize. There are a lot of churches in the world which have the teaching of one church, one city. The International Church of Christ is one of them. They believe in one church, one city. What does that boil down to, to them, really, when you get right down to the nitty gritty? It boils down to, if you're not meeting with us, then you're not in a church. And this is what the Lord's Recovery believes and teaches. That is a false teaching. That is just flat out a false teaching. They say here, furthermore, the Lord never tells us to abandon the genuine ground of oneness. That's a meaningless statement because he never tells us to embrace it. He doesn't. He tells us to embrace oneness. In a sense, the Lord never taught us to be one. He prayed that we would be one. But how much did the Lord really teach about oneness? He didn't. He taught the attitudes we need to have to maintain it. But by example, he had the boldness to speak truth to the religious leaders of that day. He told the Jews to respect the Pharisees and the religious elite because he said they sat in the seat of Moses. So he was saying, don't abandon, don't throw out the baby with the bad water. Listen to the things they say, which resonate with the truth of God. But he didn't say, do whatever these guys tell you to do and ignore any sins they commit. Even God didn't ignore the sins they committed. He was always rebuking the leaders in the Old Testament, the religious leaders who are phonies. He did it all throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus did it in the New Testament. Paul and some of the other writers in the New Testament point out hypocrites. Okay, so that's within the purview. That's in the wheelhouse of things we're allowed to do. You got to be careful and you don't want to do it gratuitously, but it's allowed if you have the conviction of it. Well, I have the conviction that these guys are very, very mistaken and they're hurting people by doing this. And it's sad. It's really sad because I've always felt like they did have something to offer. But they act like they're too good to rub elbows with people that aren't in their organization. That's not how Jesus was. He didn't treat people like lower forms of life that weren't like him. He loved everybody and he cared for everybody and he respected everybody. And these guys don't do that. So... Uh, Again, this article is talking about the two errors. Okay, the two errors is not continuing to listen to what we say and what we teach and abandoning the practical church as we've envisioned it. That's the two errors. And it's just a misapplication of principles. Yes, we need to stick with the ministry of the New Testament. Well, that's the New Testament. It's not your interpretation of it. And yes, we do need to observe oneness and community and cooperation with other Christians. And no, that does not mean we have to be in a, quote, genuine local church, unquote, as defined by them. The Bible never teaches that. And if it was as important as they say it is, then I think the Bible would have actually taught it. Why would such an important truth that they act like is spelled out in black and white in the Bible, not in the Bible? Why is that? I think it's that way because the Lord knew that if you tried to organize this thing in the way they're trying to organize it, you're going to cause problems, which they have. When they think Jew and ground and oneness, they just need to think Christ. That's it. One thing I liked about Lord's Recovery when I was in it early on was it was all about Christ. It was all about him. Now it's all about their group. So when they talk about the turmoils, what causes the turmoils? What causes the turmoils is you're expecting too much out of people. You're expecting things that the Lord doesn't expect. You're trying to maintain this ideal, pristine thing that you've envisioned, and you haven't figured out that the way you're trying to do it is the cause of the problems you're having. 
people have a right to vote with their feet. They have a right to vote with their conscience. I would never tell any Christian to abandon genuine oneness in Christ. Okay, I wouldn't. I agree with him on that. I just disagree on what that is. It's not meeting with them. Okay, it's not. And they need to figure this out. Quite frankly, I think the fact that they can't figure it out shows how clueless they are. They need to preach oneness. They need to preach agreeing with the genuine revelation of the New Testament. That's okay. You just you reach a point where you don't insist on every detail of what you think that genuine revelation is, and you stop at the place where you're beginning to start to insist people meet with you. It's real easy, if you think about it, to understand why that is the way it has to be. Otherwise, you end up lording over people. There's no way around it. They cannot have their cake and eat it too. They cannot continue to insist that they're it and really be for genuine oneness. And they cannot continue to insist people meet with them and still be for genuine oneness. Okay, there reaches a point where you are the one that's contentious, where you are the one that is causing problems, where you are the one who's being divisive. I thought of something after my last episode. The very fact that they insist on their way shows they're an organization. Because what authority do they have to insist on that unless you're in their organization? What authority do they have, especially to go to a church and insist on something? They can make all the suggestions they want, but the church doesn't have to agree with them on every detail. Agreeing with the ministry of the New Testament does not imply agreeing with these guys, but I think they actually think it does. Because they envision it as this thing that they're controlling. That's a hierarchy. It's a mini image of the Catholic Church, top-down control. It is. And you would say, we're not an organization. We don't exercise control. You know, I don't care what you call it. It is what it is. And it's both. It's both an organization and a hierarchy. And the New Testament doesn't teach that. Paul said, let each be fully persuaded in his own mind. We have a right to believe what we feel like the Lord is telling us to believe. We're all going to stand before the Lord someday and give account. Do you think if we say to him, I just did what the brothers told me to do because I believed in authority and submission, like Watchman Nee taught, the Lord will go, well, that's not the way authority works. You have to listen to me first. And I was telling you to do certain things and you didn't do them because you were afraid that you were going to get thrown out of this movement. You didn't want to risk that. You wouldn't know what to do with yourself. That's what you gave yourself to. And to some extent, you had your reward. The question is, are you faithful to your conscience? And everybody has to be faithful to their conscience. Somebody is really, really out of line. If they're taking some vague teaching that is not even spelled out in the Bible and saying, if your conscience doesn't agree with this, you're obsessed or whatever reasoning they use. Come on. Do you really think that's the way the Lord operates? He wants you in abject fear to these guys who claim to have the New Testament ministry. Don't you dare oppose them. Even if your conscience is screaming at you, just ignore it because we're for life. All these teachings, they all lead up one stream. And the stream is turn your brain off, believe everything we say, do what we say, don't leave our group. Even if you go to another church that says it's the church in the city, that doesn't count because we're not in control of it. It's not in our thing. So they're not genuine because we say so. This is what you're dealing with. Think about it. Really, intelligent people out there, please think about it. Lord's Recovery people, think about it. Lord's Recovery leaders, think about it. What are you really preserving here? Are you really preserving the Lord's move or are you preserving your way of life? We're all going to have to answer to him someday, me included. And I've prayed about this a lot, guys. I mean, I asked the Lord, what's the deal with the Lord's Recovery? What's going on with that group? And uh, he did not tell me I had to be there. He did not tell me I was a rebel. He did not tell me I'm opposing his move. He did say, be careful, because there is some good there. And I would tell everybody to do that with everybody. But when you call Christianity the present evil age, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. You're on the wrong side of the fence there, buddy on the wrong side of the fence. You're arrogant, you're presumptuous, and you're quite frankly clueless. 
you're missing something of God's nature when you say stuff like that. It's just not the way the Lord operates. Lord's recovery, worry about the errors you're making. What errors are you guys making? What errors are you making? Do you ever pray about that? Lord, what errors are we making? Instead of avoid these two errors. The two errors are if you stop listening to us and you stop meeting with us. Dressed up as some kind of faithfulness to the Lord. Come on. That will not produce what God's after. It won't. I just guarantee it won't. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Let's all try to be a bit humbler, shall we? That's it for this time. Thanks again for listening, guys. Take care.